Good afternoon, dear guests, dear delegates. Uh, I'm the ambassador of Hungary, the permanent representative uh, to the United Nations, and I'm honored to be the vice president of this conference. So let's continue uh, from 3 till 4 o'clock, the general debate. The success of the conference is clearly indicated by the great number of requests for interventions under agenda item 5A, the general debate, as you know. We much welcome this interest, and as it has been announced earlier, we will start this afternoon with the list of speakers. Before turning to the agenda item 5B, the round table two on social inclusion and the right to the highest attainable standard of health. So the round table will start at four o'clock, dear delegates. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request your continued cooperation in observing the three minutes time limit. It is serious because the microphone will be switched off automatically. I would also like to draw your attention to the possibility of sharing a long version of your statements via email to papersmart4 at un.org. With this, may I invite the first delegation who is on my list, Moldova. Moldova, uh, the permanent representative of Moldova. Oh, Ambassador, you, you. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, my delegation notes with appreciation the rich program of work of this annual conference that includes also thematic roundtables which cover important issues related to the implementation of the convention. We welcome the statement and the participation of the Secretary General Guterres in the work of the conference and commend his commitment to implement the CRPD within the United Nations. Distinguished delegates, through 2030 agenda, we committed to leave no one behind by putting people's dignity and well-being at the center of our efforts towards achieving sustainable development. The implementation of SDGs, including the targets promo promoting healthy lives and full access to ICTs and digital technologies, should bring us closer to our common goal of, of full inclusion and empowerment of persons with disabilities in our societies. The Republic of Moldova is fully committed to this aim. We ratified the convention in 2010 and submitted the initial report on its, on its implementation. The national normative and legislative framework has been also strengthened in line of CRPD and European standards. The 27-2022 National Program for Social Inclusion of the persons with disabilities is the main framework for Moldova's disability policy for the next years. It is focused in area on promoting the rights of persons with disabilities, including their inclusive education, participation in public and cultural life, as well as their access to health care and rehabilitation, information technologies, and communication. The government has also adopted the national program for 2018-2026 on the deinstitutionalization of the persons of intellectual and psychological disabilities from residential social institutions. Another important step had been the approval of a set of indicators to monitor the implementation of the convention, which would help organize the process of collecting data from relevant institutions and consolidate the reporting process, process at the national and international levels. While many positive results have been achieved in the disability field, the Republic of Moldova still witnesses a relatively limited participation of the people with disability in the political, economic, and cultural life. Physical barriers and limited access of ICTs, ICTC, uh, digital technologies, and cultural activities are among the obstacles that prevent the vulnerable group from full enjoyment of their rights. In this regard, we are determined to address those challenges in line with the CRPD objectives through effective implementation of the... Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Your Excellencies, dear guests, I would like to ask everybody in the room to pay respect to each other. The room is very, very loud. 
I asked the secretariat at the end of the room, do you listen to me, please? Do you listen to me, please? The secretariat there? Okay. So please don't speak loudly because it is really not respectful to the other delegates. Thank you very much. And I would like to give the floor to the uh, distinguished representative of Slovenia. Ladies and gentlemen, Slovenia devotes special attention to equal employment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by persons with disability, as specified in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Slovenia also supported the process of drafting the Convention and was one of its first state parties. Slovenia is committed to respecting obligations undertaken upon the ratification of the Convention. To achieve the best possible results, persons with disabilities and disability organizations should be constantly and actively engaged in all stages of its implementation, thus ensuring the inclusion of persons with disability in the rapidly changing society. It should be underlined that the Convention was translated in all accessible formats and is published on the website of the Ministry of Labor, Family, Social Affairs and Equal Opportunities. It is vital to give all persons with disability, including the blind and partially sighted, the deaf and hard of hearing, and persons with intellectual disabilities, the chance to be properly informed. Since the ratification of the Convention, a number of measures have been adopted with a view to ensuring the inclusion of persons with disabilities in society, combating stereotypes, prejudice, and harmful practices relating to such persons, promoting positive perceptions and greater social awareness toward them, regulating the right to their vocational rehabilitation and employment. In addition, Slovenia is striving through legislation and especially through the Personal Assistance Act to improve the quality of life in, of individuals suffering from disability and their families. Measures have been adopted to increase social cohesion, social inclusion, and participation in all areas of social life for all groups of persons with disabilities. Mr. Mrs. Chair, let me conclude by saying that Slovenia will continue its activities to strengthen the inclusion of persons with disabilities in all spheres of life. Implementation is a constant process in which the work is never completed. In order, to, in order to achieve a productive inclusion and participation of persons with disabilities in society, continuous cooperation is required among all governmental institutions, disabled people's organization, and other organizations addressing issues relating to disability. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to the uh, delegate from Jamaica. Don't you have a... Jamaica is pleased to participate in the 12th session of the Conference of State Parties to the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Jamaica remains committed today to the full implementation of the CRPD as it did when it became the first country to sign and ratify the convention in 2007 and the first country in the Caribbean to submit its report. Since then, Jamaica has adopted a systematic and strategic approach towards the development and empowerment of persons with disabilities through its Vision 2030 National Development Plan, which is aligned to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. In that regard, Jamaica will be seeking to implement regulations as well as six codes of practice for practical guidelines for inclusion and strengthen the governance structure for the Jamaica Council for Persons with Disabilities. The Disabilities Rights Tribunal will also be established in the near future to hear cases of discrimination against persons with disabilities and to adjudicate same. Technology, digitalization, and ICTs are the engines for social and economic advancement nationally and globally. And Jamaica is on the drive to develop a knowledge-based and digital society in which persons with disabilities are empowered and can use their knowledge to drive innovation, entrepreneurship, and enhance their quality of life. Some of the initiatives include scaling up internet connectivity in more publicly accessible spaces to create community access points in undeserved communities, installing communities, 
computers equipped with speed software in the public libraries island-wide, enhancing access to information on services and modernization of six special education institutions to enable persons with disabilities in their educational development. In the area of social inclusion and health, Jamaica continues to make notable advancements towards achieving the outcome of a healthy and stable population, including by reducing barriers for persons with disabilities. Programs being implemented include strengthening the primary health care and health promotion as well as pro providing access to essential medicine. The pursuit of universal health coverage and accessibility features are being factored into all refurbishing or construction of new health facilities to ensure efficient and cost-effective service delivery. Jamaica is making strides to ensure national sports facilities are accessible to persons with disabilities and these individuals can participate in activities including band cricket competitions, special Olympics, and international Paralympics committee. JCPD has increased national awareness campaign to strengthen the education on, on the po National Disabilities Act. Efforts being made to improve the access to information through the physical activity guide being produced to for persons with disabilities to access health and nutritional information. In conclusion, we are continuing to pursue and hide efforts for empowerment, integration, and participation in all facets of life as we strive to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, and raise. Thank you very much for Jamaica. I would like to give the floor to the distinguished delegate from Iraq. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Persons with disability are exposed to discrimination every day. They face obstacles that limit their participation on equal footing with the others. They are deprived from their rights of inclusion, just like everyone else or securing a job or living independently in the society and moving freely and participating in different sports and cultural activities or enjoying social protection with dignity or reaching justice easily in addition to other services. Thus, we urge the international community to adopt a number of measures, including changing the wide-ranging concept of disability, which is based on charity work, to a methodology based on rights. Therefore, we perceive that uh, the concept of people with special needs is more pragmatic and practical if compared with people with disabilities. It would describe a strata society that is full with energy to innovate and change to the better. Persons with psychological disability are usually exposed to uh, violence, to harm, abuse, and sexual harassment. Terrorist groups smuggle their organs and abuse their mental defects to use them in suicide operations or use them as human shields in the hotspots of terrorist organizations. The media, especially social media, play an important role in raising awareness of the rights of persons with disability and combat discrimination against them. It endeavors to ensure their participation in public life. Many persons with disability are still unaware of their rights. Women with disability are more prone to discrimination by men, by traditions and social norms. We also call upon the international community to provide support to um, provide treatment for disabilities due to mines, explosives, or terrorist acts. We have to improve health care specialized for this category. We should also allocate a percentage of job opportunities to persons with disability. We've activated this measure in Iraq, whereby 5% of uh, job opportunities were allocated to persons with disability, and a monthly salary was allocated for people caring full-time for people with disability. 
Sorry, we can no longer hear the speaker. Thank you very much. I would like to say that your speech can be put on the website so that we could see the whole speech of yours. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to give the floor now to the distinguished uh, delegate of Luxembourg. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Luxembourg, Luxembourg concurs with the declaration of the EU. In the last few years, Luxembourg has uh, taken a significant number of measures and legislative initiatives to improve the situation of persons with disabilities and their inclusion in society. I will confine myself to uh, give you the most important aspects. The second national plan of action to implement the CRPD is being developed in close cooperation with organizations of and for persons with disabilities and uh, persons uh, in a situation of disability. One of the cross-cutting subjects of this plan of action is design for all in all areas, which is a prerequisite to create an inclusive society. And so it's along these lines that the government in July 2018 tabled a bill on access to all open public spaces. It says that requirements for access will no longer be limited to public domain, but now will also need to apply to any collective use, public and private, including cultural, sport, and leisure sites, such as cinemas, restaurants, and sporting stadiums. The bill uh, also includes existing public spaces and projects for significant transformation of public ways, as well as accessibility of new uh, buildings, uh, residential buildings. The objective is to gradually increase uh, accessible housing, which would be easily adaptable to the needs of persons with disabilities in uh, the entire country. In terms of integration and uh, maintaining uh, employment for persons with disabilities, we have a, a bill to uh, cr for more inclusion in employment, and that was tabled in March 2018. This bill uh, calls for giving to employers uh, on a free basis the possibility of uh, retaining an expert, an external expert, uh, whose job it will be for three years to help in the vocational integration of persons with disabilities within the business. And finally, uh, a bill that recognizes sign language as a full-fledged language has been adopted. And uh, among other things, this law gives uh, children and uh, hearing impaired or deaf people the right to uh, learn German sign language and to be able to follow fundamental uh, education and primary and secondary in sign language. It's undeniable that this will allow for greater social inclusion of the hearing impaired or deaf. Given these examples, it's obvious that uh, a policy in favor of the rights of persons with uh, disabilities, uh, sound is cut. Thank you. Much. And um, now I would like to give the floor to... Um to an NGO, Standing Voice. Distinguished delegates, I am here on behalf of Standing Voice, an NGO fighting to defend the rights of persons with albinism in Africa. We note with satisfaction the recent reports of the independent expert on the enjoyment of human rights by people with albinism, who is organising a side event here tomorrow in commemoration of International Albinism Awareness Day. People with albinism continue to face discrimination and violence across Africa. In Standing Voice's principal countries of operation, Tanzania and Malawi, albinism is often shrouded in myth. Many people with albinism are shut out of civil participation and unable to access the most basic opportunities and services, including healthcare, education, housing and employment. Women with albinism have been raped in the belief that their bodies can cure infertility and AIDS, while opportunistic witch doctors continue to incite violence by peddling the myth that the body parts of a person with albinism can generate wealth and fortune when used in witchcraft. This appalling misconception has caused 209 people to be murdered and 587 to be attacked across 28 African countries since 2006. Tanzania presents a unique 
a uniquely severe case with 76 murders, but the center of gravity has recently switched to Malawi, where 26 murders and 161 human rights violations have been reported since 2014. One recent case involved a 54-year-old man with albinism in northern Malawi who was dragged from his home and murdered in front of his nine-year-old son. Both hands were amputated and his heart was removed. Standing Voice has learned over the last decade that this issue is far too complex and too multifaceted to be met with a single response. Instead, we have to act holistically and match the interlocking needs of people with albinism with a diversity of interventions. Delivering programs in health, education, advocacy, and economic empowerment, Standing Voice is now supporting over 5,500 people with albinism across Tanzania and Malawi. We have established clinical networks to treat visual impairment and prevent skin cancer. We have relocated children with albinism from segregated institutions to inclusive schools and universities. And we have supported hundreds of adults to rebuild their lives through apprenticeships and training. People with albinism in Africa are truly among the furthest behind. To bring an end to the discrimination and violence they face, renewed commitment from all stakeholders is required. We need better, more accurate data. We need to do more to support survivors. It's not acceptable to quarantine children in protectorate camps, and it's certainly not enough to listen to their stories being brutally recycled in the press. Instead, we must mobilize, we must learn from each other, and more than anything, we must harness the promise to leave no one behind as the guiding structural principle of all our programming. As the Secretary General highlighted yesterday upon the opening of this conference, we need more than words. Leave no one behind cannot just be lip service. It is right and it is necessary that everyone has a seat at the table and that people with albinism are given the space to define their own needs and to lead the design and delivery of programmes intended to address those needs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. Now we will continue with the member states. First, I will give the floor to the distinguished representative of Costa Rica, followed by Guatemala. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chair. For the delegation of Costa Rica, we are indeed honored to participate in this 12th Conference of State Parties. And we'd like to thank you uh, for this and wish you every success uh, both um, today and tomorrow. Costa Rica reasserts its commitment to achieve standards of equality and uh, the opportunities set forth in the Convention to ensure the respect of the human rights and dignity of all those with disabilities. We also wish to say that we join with the, the statement made on behalf of the group of friends of persons with disabilities. Firm in this belief, since uh, 2016 in Costa Rica, a, 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 a law 9379 was approved to ensure legal equality uh, for the disabled, doing away with the restrictions on their legal capacity, particularly guardianship and uh, legal incompetence, and uh, setting up uh, optional safeguards for the exercise of legal capacity pursuant to Article 12 of the um, Convention. We are at present. Uh, implementing this. At present, we're working on training uh, those in the digital sector and uh, empowering uh, people to uh, fulfill uh, this uh, standard. And uh, we uh, also have uh, subsidies for those assisting uh, people with disabilities uh, who are poor and who's, uh, who require these subsidies. And then to uh, measure uh, po poverty, we've uh, set up a special line of uh, poverty amongst the disabled. Um, we measured uh, resources of people, uh, families, households. And we don't just look at the basic shopping basket, but also that for uh, resulting from disability and other costs of uh, assistance. In a world where change is so rapid, we have to ensure that we have a, a sufficient statistics and information uh, to guide us in what we do. As a result of this, in 2014, we started uh, our first uh, uh, system of providing information on disability. And as a result of this, we uh, see that 18.2 uh, of the adult population is, is suffers disabilities, and 61% are women. These results enable us to assess the impact and efficiency of our policies in all spheres of the a convention, because that was the framework for the survey. We have also made progress in uh, the access of uh, the disabled to information uh, technologies, ITC, by means of uh, technological kits, which are uh, provided free of charge. We, we 
are aware of what we need to do both in the public and private sector and only by working very hard can we assure that the uh, motto nothing about us without us becomes a reality thank you thank you very much i always think if you speak spanish you can speak much more right <laughs> in the same time really lucky Okay, um, thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to the distinguished uh, delegate uh, from Guatemala, uh, followed by Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Madam, Se the floor is yours. Señora Presidente. Madam Chair, may I congratulate you uh, as you uh, chair the 12th session of this very important conference. Mm, Guatemala is a middle-income country, and we still face structural gulfs, sort of low productivity, social segregation, and shortcomings when it comes to health, access to basic services, and education. And uh, these particularly, these shortcomings particularly affect children, young people, and those with disabilities. My delegation agrees with the, the statement made by the Secretary General to the effect that we need to make rapid and effective progress in implementing the outcome of the work. World Summit uh, of the 2030 Agenda, uh, this, uh, dealing with inequality in all uh, realms, adopting inclusive policies, be they macroeconomic, fiscal, on employment, on the labour market, or providing social protection, to ensure that there is inclusion. I wish to say that uh, we have... Uh, I have been involved uh, in the struggles of um, persons with disability uh, uh, to ensure that their uh, rights are recognized, and this is why I have the honor of representing the estate of uh, Guatemala today, thus illustrating uh, an intersectional approach. Um, I'm a woman and a, a short person. Uh, we are uh, working to ensure that we can implement um, the Marrakesh uh, Treaty and uh, providing guidelines. Uh, and we are involve uh, persons with disabilities as uh, we uh, try to make a good uh, cultural shortcomings, as we look at prevention, preparation, mitigation, and uh, response when it comes to disasters, uh, as indicated by the Sendai framework. We uh, have a... Um, uh, the Vice President of the Republic uh, working on a department for disability. So we're working in a way uh, to bring about the, the removal of girls and boys with disabilities from institutions, the deinstitutionalization. Uh, Emma Meyer, the um, Speaker of uh, uh, the Central American uh, Parliament, uh, in the reunion uh, of heads of state and government in Central America, uh, stated uh, that uh, there is support for creating a regional body for the rights of those with uh, disabilities in you know, Central America and the Dominican Republic uh, so that they can truly play a relevant role in ensuring that there are better conditions so that they can exercise their right to vote and to, be, uh, uh, and, and to stand for office. We are making progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to the representative of Democratic Re People's Republic of Korea, followed by Afghanistan. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. The, I would like to take this opportunity to point out the politics of my government for protection of the right of persons with a disability. It is a supreme principle of the state activity of DPRK to place the interest of the people and ensure that they enjoy dignified life. The government of the DPRK attached great importance to the issue for protection of the right of persons with disability. My government has reflected this issue on the Constitution and regulated the relevant provision on the several law, including socialist labor law and the law on education, etc. The Central Committee of the Korean Federation for Protection of the Person with Disability was founded in 1998 in order to assist the activity of my government in implementation of its policy. In align with the 12 years compulsory education system, since 2015, the blind and the deaf school have revised their curricula so that person with a disability can receive the education through a distant education system established at the national or local university. Madam Chair, it is very important to fully implement the CRPD in protecting and promoting right of person with disability. DPRK signed the CRPD in July 2013 
and ratified it in November 2016. At the present, we actively take domestic measures for implementation of the CRPD and submitted the initial report to UN last year. The DPRK attached great importance to international cooperation with the UN agencies. I'm convinced that the visit of the UN Special Rapporteur on the right of person with a disability to my country two years ago that served as a significant opportunity in establishing and developing constructive relations between my country and international organization. DPRK is making every effort to consolidate material foundation of the socialism by concentrating all national resources on the economic construction, pushed to policy speech addressed by Chairman Kim Jong-un, a state affairs commission of the DPRK. The DPRK the remain in consistent principal position to promote dialogue and cooperation for protections, promotion of genuine human rights. However, DPRK a totally reject the politicization, selectivity, and double stand of the human rights, and strongly oppose any attempt to abuse human rights issue for impuring political purpose aimed at overthrowing the sovereign state. In conclusion, the DPRK, as a state party to CRPD, will faithfully implement its obligation for protection of the right of person with disability. I just summarize my speech and then I'll circulate the whole text. I thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to the representative of Afghanistan, followed by Indonesia. Head of delegations, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to participate in the 12th session of this conference of the state parties to a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, focusing on the very important theme of ensuring inclusion of persons with disabilities in a changing world through the implementation of the CRPD. The government of Afghanistan is committed to include persons with disabilities into mainstream public policies and programs focusing on their needs, identifying barriers, and providing strategic guidelines to overcome difficulties faced by persons with disabilities and has taken a number of legislative and policy measures that indicates a strong commitment to advancing the rights of persons with disabilities. For many years, the government of Afghanistan provided services for persons with disabilities under the Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, Martyrs, and Disabled. On October 2018, the government of Afghanistan established an independent organization by the name of National Support Authority for Persons with Disabilities and Martyrs Affairs. On January 2019, taking one step further, the organization was upgraded to State Ministry for Disabled and Martyred Affairs in order to provide better and exclusive services for persons with disabilities. The Afghan government has drafted memorandum of our understandings with more than 35 entities and organizations in Afghanistan in order to include disabilities in their mandates. The government has also established and as a, a committee and a secretariat for disabilities under the direct supervision of the President Office in the, of Afghanistan to ensure the rights of persons with disabilities are protected. On May 2019, Afghanistan proposed amendment and major changes into the law on the rights and benefits of persons with disabilities, which promotes their integration into public and social life, prohibits any form of discrimination against them, provides them financial aid and guarantees their active participation and reintegration into society, a very significant step towards implementation of the CRPD. Distinguished delegates, this year the government of Afghanistan will be developing a five-year national policy and strategy for persons with disabilities which includes measures to improve their access to education, employment, justice, protection, care, social insurance and social assistance which is also part of our national priority program and national development strategy. We are also working towards making Afghanistan's school system inclusive for all children, increasing public health services to better serve persons with disabilities, and providing vocational training along with employment opportunities for Afghans with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm giving the floor now to a representative of Indonesia, followed by um, the Leprosy Mission International. Thank you, Madam Chair. Indonesia aligns its statement with the statement by, made by ASEAN, MICTA, and group of friends of older persons. Madam Chairman, there are approximately 20 million persons with disabilities in Indonesia. In line with the spirit of reformation within the last decade, the government has taken fundamental steps to strengthen its legal and institutional frameworks to promote and protect human rights for all, including persons with disabilities. In this context, 
the breakthrough in the effort to promote and protect their rights is by changing the mindset of policymaker and community as a whole. The government mainstream a right-based perspective in the current development planning, budgeting, and in the implementation of relevant policies and programs to overcome barriers and discrimination, as well as to accommodate the rights and empower persons with disabilities at national and local levels. Indonesia has taken concrete measures to respect the rights of people with disabilities of having equal opportunity in celebrating democracy. In the national election last month, polling station provided disabled access accessible facilities, braille printed ballots, and personal assistance to assist persons with disabilities in polling booth as deemed necessary. I'm also pleased to inform you that Indonesia is at the final pay phase of establishing National Human Rights Commission for Persons with Disabilities, as mandated by Law Number 8, 2016, on Persons with Disabilities. Meanwhile, the existing National Human Rights Commission has created a national firm network for a complaints mechanism on various disability issues. Madam Chairman, to sustain the inclusion of persons with disabilities, the government has established the Disability Vocational Training Center in Sipinong, West Java. The center equips persons with disabilities with various skill and ability in order to generate adequate income to support themselves and their families. Most graduates have been employed by companies in major cities across the country. Indonesia is also actively contributing to promoting the rights of persons at multilateral fora by proudly having Ms. Irishnawati as CRPD Committee 2019-2020. To conclude, Madam, Chair, Mr. Ch uh, Madam Chairman, Allow me to conclude by reaffirming Indonesia's commitment to the progress of the CRPD and her confidence that this 12th session will contribute to, the, to our collective commitments to ensure inclusion in, of persons with, with disabilities as part of fulfilling the 2030 goals. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And now I'm giving the floor to the Leprosy Mission International, followed again by Member State Myanmar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, firstly, on behalf of the Leprosy Mission, I would like to congratulate the Executive Committee of the Secretary General for highlighting the urgent need of the UN systems to further enhance their track record of disability inclusion and especially in supporting the member countries to achieve the 2030 agenda of leaving no one behind. In order to further strengthen this framework of accountability and based on our experiences of having worked with UN agencies in different countries, I would like to put forth our suggestions having regard some of the main elements of the disability inclusion strategy for consideration of the UN country teams while implementing this strategy. Firstly, with regard to planning and management of the strategy, the participation of persons with disabilities has received due consideration under the strategy and it is critical that the UN country teams consider the participation of persons with disabilities during the formulation of the UN Development Assistance Framework. And as a baseline information, it would also be useful to know to date how many UN country teams have actually consulted persons with disabilities and their representative organisations on the basis of existing guidelines during the preparations of UNDAF. Uh, secondly, with regards to organisational culture around the strategy, it is important to have online trainings on disability inclusion for the UN staff at pre-employment or pre-entry level, as done by some of the agencies uh, in the case of gender, ethics, and legal frameworks. And then thirdly, it has been rightly pointed out in the report that there is a lack of understanding on how to mainstream disability and lack of incentive to promote disability inclusion within UN systems. And to further empower UN country teams to support the national governments in achieving the 2030 agenda, and build their own capacities in mainstreaming disability, it is suggested to introduce a disability equality seal, as done by the UNDP in the case of the gender equality seal. And the practice of the gender equality seal has incentivized UNDP country officers to integrate gender equality in all aspects of the development work. And after complying with a set of recommended standards, the country officers obtain gold, silver, or bronze certification. In closing, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Bureau of the 12th Conference for providing an opportunity for civil society organisations like ours, the Leprosy Mission, to participate in the general debate and to express our views on the implementation of the Convention. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to the delegate of Armenia, followed by Laos. Sorry, sorry, Myanmar. Myanmar first, followed by Armenia. My fault. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the situation of the rights of persons with disabilities in Myanmar has improved substantially over the past decade, a commitment which is reflected at the international, regional, and national levels. The 2008 Constitution of Myanmar guarantees the fundamental rights and equal opportunities of the dis disabled citizens. In 2011, <clears throat> The government took an important step forward in its international commitment by acceding to the CRPD. Since then, it has undertaken significant steps towards the full realization of the co convention. A milestone was achieved in June 2015 when the Law on Protection and Promotion of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was enacted. In 2017, the National Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Myanmar Federation of Persons with Dis Disabilities were established. Myanmar is also actively taking part in the activities of regional frameworks, including within the ASEAN. The Myanmar National Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, chaired by the Vice President, held its fourth meeting yesterday on the 11th of June in Myanmar, which coincides with our meeting here in New York. The government is also undertaking legislative reforms, which include revamping the child rights law with a whole chapter dedicated to the rights of children with disabilities. A national strategic master plan for people with disabilities is currently being drafted, and it is expected to be completed in December this year. It is in line with the 2030 agenda and will com complement the, member, uh, sorry, the Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan. The master plan envisions to significantly increase opportunities and participation of persons with disabilities in all areas towards building an inclusive society. The government has laid down an inclusive education policy with special education programs for disabled children, schools for children with special needs, and disabled care centers for different kinds of disabilities have been set up across the country. Myanmar Care uh, moreover, um, in Myanmar, caregiver trainings for parents of special needs children have been conducted. Another important initiative is the launch of the Handbook on Employing Persons with Disabilities in 2018 to help employers to promote employment of persons with disabilities and to create accessible employment opportunities for them. In concluding, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would like to reassure uh, our commitment to make e every effort to protect and promote the rights of persons with dis disabilities and create an, an inclusive environment. We shall continue to work with our local and international partners to full realization of the CRPD with a view to achieving the goals of 2030 agenda with leaving no one behind. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And now I would like to give the floor to the delegate of Armenia, followed by Laos. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities continues to be the guiding international document for the Republic of Armenia while shaping its legislation and policies in this important area. Development of human potential, including protection of rights and dignity of persons with disabilities and their social inclusion are among the priorities of the Armenian government. Armenia aims to elaborate more targeted state employment policies, introduce new programs focused on making people with disabilities more uh, competitive through better linkage between education and labor market. Armenian legislation gives priority to the persons with disabilities when it comes to inclusion in the state-run training programs on employment. To ensure mandatory workplaces, the law also establishes quota system for all organizations, irrespective of their form of ownership. Madam Chair, the 2018 United Nations Report on Disability and Development highlights the wide scope of opportunities of increased access to information and communication technologies in facilitating participation in social, cultural, and political life and in provision of services to pe persons with disabilities. It also identifies challenges and gaps in this area. In Armenia, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs cooperates closely with UN partners to provide high-quality services and information 
uh, to pe persons with disabilities. One of the examples implemented in this regard is the mapping of organization and services and creation of an information system, SOTSUM, a website that provides online services and is being employed as an analytical tool to assess and address the existing gaps. The rights of persons with disabilities and issues of physical access are the integral part of the urban planning reforms in Armenia. These include revision of normative technical documents as well as a monitoring mechanism with the aim to have more accessible urban environment. Madam Chair, the government of Armenia adopted human rights-based approach as a fundamental principle to its policies of inclusion, equality, and assistance to persons with disabilities. We view civil society organizations as core partners, collaborators, and drivers for change in our country. Today we have the leading advocates for disability rights among the members of the government. We are happy to note the positive record of cooperation with NGOs in various areas such as awareness raising, provision of alternative services, social integration and many others. We have examples when small scale movements of active citizens brought about the real change in the area of assistance to vulnerable families of children with disabilities by spreading knowledge, find, uh, uh, fighting stigmatization, by reaching out and involving policy makers. Today, the institutionalization and organization of child care in the family environment is one of the major priorities in the area of the rights of a child. This has particular significance for children with disabilities. Madam Chair, this year Armenia assumed the chairmanship of UN Commission on Status of Women for its 64th session, an important junction when in 2020 UN member states will be celebrating the 25th anniversary of Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and reviewing the implementation of this milestone document. We believe this will be an important moment also for a forward-looking approach and commitment towards gender equality and empowerment of women and girls with disabilities. I Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Madam. And I would like to give the floor to the delegate of Laos, followed by Peru. Thank you, Madam Chair. My delegation aligns itself with a statement to be made by Malaysia on behalf of ASEAN, and I wish to make a few remarks in my national capacity. Having attached importance to the issue of persons with disability, the Lao PDR became party to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Person with Disability in 2009. Since then, policies have been implemented, resulting in the enactment of the legislation related to the person with disability in the country. These include, among others, the issuance of the decree on the CRPD in 2009, and most recently, the promulgation of the law on persons with disability in May this year. In addition, various organizations working to support persons with disability, such as National Commission for Persons with Disability, the Lao Disabled People's Association, the Lao Disabled Women's Development Center, the Lao Association of the Blind, the Lao Autism Association, and the Lao Association of the Dead have been established. The government is working with these organizations, development partners, international organizations, and NGO to promote and protect the rights of the person with disabilities in order for them to participate in the national development, political, social, economic life, both directly and indirectly, so that they can live their life with dignity in the society. Madam Chair, I wish to point out a fact that unexploded honors or UXO is a major cause of disabilities in the Laopedia. Between 1964 to 2008, more than 50,000 people have fallen victims to the UXOs, of whom around 30 die and uh, 30,000 die and 20,000 survive, including more than 13,000 people who have become disabled. Madam Chairperson, the Laopedia presented for the first time its national report on the implementation of the CRPD in 2016, reaffirming that the purpose of the CRPD is in line with our constitution, related laws and objectives and policy by highlighting the commitment and progress made by the government of the Laopedia in CRPD implementation. Let me conclude, Madam Chair, by stressing the need for enhanced support and cooperation from the international community for the developing countries, especially the least developed countries like the Lapidia, which have numerous challenges to address, including the disability issue in our pursuit of sustainable development. 
Thank you very much. So that no one will be left behind. That was the last sentence. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to the representative of Peru, followed by Austria. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I should like at the outset to say how pleased my delegation is uh, at seeing you in the chair for uh, this uh, 12th uh, Conference of States Parties on the CRPD. And uh, we wish to extend our congratulations to the other members of the Bureau and the Secretariat. Peru uh, stands firm uh, to its commitment to leave no one behind in the framework of the SDGs of the 2030 Agenda. And we see per people with disabilities as a part and parcel of human diversity, and we recognize the po their potential as uh, drivers of development. My country has uh, taken various steps uh, to implement uh, gradually the provisions of the Convention. I would like to underscore the fact that we have taken strides uh, forward um, regarding the rights of pe persons with disabilities. Our legislative decree, 1384, uh, changed our civil code, uh, recognizing the full legal capacity of persons with disabilities in order to ensure that they can take independent decisions uh, and uh, be uh, legally competent in all aspects of their lives. Uh, regardless of whether uh, reasonable uh, 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 adjustments or support has, has to be provided to uh, express their will here. We also have uh, promulgated a, a regulation on a system of support uh, to help uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, with the participation of uh, persons with disabilities. We are drawing up uh, regulations to determine procedures uh, for providing assistance and safeguards. On education as well, we are combating stigmatization and dismissal of persons with disabilities. Our law 30797 states that educational institutions must adopt measures to ensure accessibility, availability, um, uh, acceptability uh, for educational services that must be appropriately adapted, um, uh, such as, as personalized education plans for students with special needs without any additional cost for pupils. Again, we have enacted uh, another law, 30863, to involve uh, persons with disabilities in uh, scientific research programs and promote the development of uh, projects which can improve the living standard, their living standards. In uh, January 2019, the national plan uh, for those on the autistic spectrum, uh, 2019 to 21, was uh, approved for early detection and diagnosis, early action, health protection, uh, full education, vocational training, uh, inclusion in the labor market uh, uh, here. Uh, when it comes to labor and uh, social protection, we are working in a cross-cutting fashion. I'm afraid the speaker's mic has been cut off. Thank you very much. That was the end. I really think that all the interventions are been so exciting and inspiring, and I really would like to ask you to put your version on the internet so that we could really read it in the full length. Now, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to give the floor to the Charge d'Affaires of Austria, followed by NGO Special Olympics International. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Austria aligns itself with the statements made on behalf of the European Union, as well as the Group of Friends of Persons with Disabilities, and we, of course, fully support the points raised therein. Um, therefore, I would like to focus on just two points. First, it is evident that the potential of people with disabilities is underutilized in most spheres of society, including the labor market. Uh, this clearly contradicts the principle of inclusion as enshrined in the CRPD, and we need to do more to address this. We need to make sure that people with disabilities are enabled to participate in all discussions and decision-making processes affecting them. Therefore, participation is a central aspect of the Austrian National Action Plan on Disability. 
as the current National Action Plan is set to expire next year. The work on the next generation of the National Action Plan has begun and persons with disabilities will be fully involved in this process. The responsible Ministry of Social Affairs has already begun the creation of a total of 25 teams, reflecting re the respective responsibilities of the federal ministries and the regional governments. These teams consist of experts from the administration, different stakeholders and interest groups, as well as civil society experts. Disabled persons organizations will play a central role in these teams, and the teams will develop proposals for objectives and indicators, as well as for concrete measures. The participation of civil society is supposed to continue until final decision making to ensure that the renewed national action plan on disability will be as sustainable and widely accepted as possible. Second, I would like to stress the importance of informing people with learning disabilities about the full text of the CRPD. Like Austria, many state parties have published easy to read versions of the CRPD which only summarize the CRPD. This makes it difficult for people with learning disabilities, as well as other groups of people with disabilities, to discuss in detail the specific articles of the CRPD, and so to speak, excludes these people from having a say. Earlier this year, therefore, Austria published a new easy to read version of the CRPD in German, which was developed in cooperation with people with learning disabilities. This version now contains the complete text of the CRPD and is openly available on the internet. And we would very much welcome if as many states, uh, parties as possible could follow this example and disseminate the complete CRPD to everybody. Finally, Madam President, let me add that Austria warmly welcomes the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy. Um, we look forward to seeing how it will work in practice in order to strengthen the inclusion of persons with disabilities here in the UN family. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to the representative of Special Olympics International. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Nyashe Derera from Special Olympics Zimbabwe, and I'm here representing athletes all over the world, persons with intellectual disability, as I also happen to have intellectual disability. I would like to thank you for giving me such a wonderful, amazing opportunity to speak before you, our honorable guest, full of love, boldness, and understanding. As you know, Special Olympics offers all Olympic type of sport to children and adults with intellectual disability, advocating for inclusion in all spheres of life. I've got a story to share with you what I've experienced. Uh, I, in my country, I visited the hospital four times, but I couldn't get uh, the treatment that I was looking for because I couldn't explain what I, was, or what I was going through to the nurse. So I'm appealing to the member states here present so that they can come up with, uh, with policies and also necessary skills. They can teach community health workers, doctors, nurses, how can they help, uh, help us to understand what we are going through when we visit their institution. And I'm also appealing to the member state here present that now we are living in a global computer village. Everything is digitalized. We need those skills so that we are equipped whenever we need to, to reply emails, being active on social media so that we are not left behind in terms of technological world. And also remember that no one applied to be born what is or she is in life. We need to accept each other as we are. And also we need to earn a living. We are, uh, we are appealing to the member states here present to pass laws and policies uh, to the companies to at least employ a person with intellectual disability or hire them at their companies. Remember, the revolution is inclusion. Hashtag choose to include. I believe in the world where everyone is included, a world where everyone is included and also accepted, irregardless of their disability. As you see, intellectual disability is not perceived with the naked eye. Uh, it's not perceived with the naked eye whenever you visit an institution. So I'm appealing to the member state here present also to pass laws that can help us to access all the needs in various sectors of life. Thank you. Remember, choose to include. Hashtag choose to include. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir. We will remember included, accepted. I think that was a great summary of this first hour of this afternoon. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, now we finished the general debate part of this afternoon, and I want to inform you that from tomorrow, from 10 o'clock, we will continue in the same, here at the same conference room, uh, the general debate. And now we will recess uh, in a very few minutes the, the podium, and we will uh, continue with our round table. Thank you very much.
Your Excellencies, Delegates, Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to take your seats, please? And would you respect everybody in the room, even if you are walking around? Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the second thematic roundtable. As uh, one of the co-chairs of the discussion, uh, I am the Hungarian ambassador, permanent representative here at the United Nations. I am very happy to welcome the civil society colleague, Ms. Kate Swoffer, current chair, CEO, and co-founder of Dementia Alliance International. Together, we will facilitate this roundtable discussion on the important issue of social inclusion and the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Ladies and gentlemen, dear delegates, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental human rights of every human being. The CRPD reaffirms this right for persons with disabilities. However, available evidence suggests that access to health services is still a challenge for persons. Dear delegates, may I ask you either delegates May I ask you either to take your seats or speak outside the room? Can I ask you for that? Thank you. However, available evidence suggests that access to health services is still a challenge for persons with disabilities due to the numerous barriers for availability, accessibility, and affordability of the full range of quality health care services, limitations on health insurance, as well as legal, institutional, attitudinal barriers and stigma within the healthcare system about persons with disabilities. Our roundtable this afternoon will offer an opportunity to discuss some of the key issues and challenges faced by the particular group in our society and at the same time to share good practices and experience in advancing access to good quality, effective and affordable health information and services to all persons with disabilities. I would like to warmly welcome our distinguished panelists who are present on the podium. Mr. Han Jin Ju, professor in the Department of Social Welfare from the Republic of Korea. Mr. Anthony Dutin, public health leader, World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization. Ms. Catalina De Vandas, special rapporteur on the rights of the persons with disabilities, a great champion of this conference. Mr. Curry Earl, President, People's First of Canada. Ms. Jenny Rosa Damayanti, board member, Transforming Communities for Inclusion of Persons with Psychological Disabilities from Indonesia. To have a focused and interactive discussion, I would kindly ask each of the panelists to make an initial presentation of five minutes. After presentations, we will invite delegations to join a follow-up interactive discussion with panel members who will respond to questions and comments from the floor. In that segment of about an hour, there will be opportunities for delegations and other observers to either pose their specific questions to panelists or to make brief comments that must be relevant to the current discussion in the roundtable in two minutes. Delegations can make such requests by pressing your button after we will open the floor when all the panelists have finished their presentations. Accredited NGOs and other participants have prior to this conference already submitted their requests in writing via email to the Secretariat. When they are invited to speak, they shall take the designated NGO seat and speak from that seat. Please note, all interventions shall be strictly limited to no longer than two minutes, as I said, with no exception. 
Now, let me turn to our distinguished panelists. Please note that when making your oral representations, presentations and engaging in the interactive discussion, you are invited to address one or two of the following questions as outlined in the background paper for the roundtable. A, what factors need to be considered to improve the access by persons with disabilities to good quality, non-discriminatory, and affordable health services, health care services? B, what actions, laws, and policies are needed by governments to ensure respect for the right to free and informed consent and to further raise awareness among health professionals or disability inclusive health services and facilities and to empower persons with disabilities themselves with information to make free and informed health care decisions. C, in view of ex existing uh, inequalities in society, how can the government and other stakeholders address the disparate access to health technologies and ensure appropriate access to essential health care so that the highest attainable standard of uh, physical and mental health can be achieved for all, including persons with disabilities. D, share one or two examples of a city or community to showcase and discuss why and how community-based rehabilitation and inclusive development has helped in making health facilities and services more accessible to and inclusive of persons with disability. And finally, E, what specific measures can be taken by governments, international organizations, and civil society to increase opportunities for all persons with disabilities to have their health care needs met? Very, very exciting questions, topics, themes to be discussed today. And now, it is my honor to introduce and invite our first panelist speaker, Mr. Han Jinjo, professor in the Department of Social Welfare from the Republic of Co uh, Korea, Daegu University. Between 2009 and 10, Professor Joe worked as part of the steering group on the third Asian Pacific Decade of Disabled Persons for the Ministry of Health, Welfare, and Family Affairs and Rehabilitation of Korea. Since 2016, he has worked as director of the Korean Association Against Drug Abuse at Daegu University. Professor Joe holds degrees in pharmaceutics and PhD in social work. Mr. Han Jin Jo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. It is my privilege to make a statement about a very important topic when it comes to treating the topic of social inclusion and the right to the highest attainable standard of health. I would like to present to you matters regarding the health of persons with disabilities, disabilities that have currently become an issue, not only in Korea, but I suspect in other countries as well. To bridge gaps in health and accessing health care between persons and with and without disabilities, Korea in December uh, 2015 enacted the Act on Guarantee of Right to Health and Access to Medical Services for persons with disabilities, which went, in, if, went into effect from December 2017. It is Article 7 of this Act that stipulates guaranteed access to and use of medical institutions by persons with dis disabilities. Where persons with dis disabilities use medical in institutions, Article 7, Article 9 specifies that the national and local governments may provide appropriate accommodations suited to the characteristics of persons with dis disabilities and transportation convenience to guarantee access to medical institutions. This article also specifies that the government may implement visiting care programs for persons with disabilities who have difficulty in using medical institutions directly. 
In accordance with Article 16 of the same Act, the Ministry of Health and Welfare has been carrying out pilot projects on a system for the physicians in charge of the health of persons with disabilities since May 2018. This system is designed to enable persons with severe disabilities to receive sustained and comprehensive care for their chronic illnesses and disability-related health conditions by allowing them personally select their physicians in charge. Furthermore, the same act stipulates that medical institutions satisfying standards on facilities, personnel, and equipment as defined by ordinance of the Ministry of Health and Welfare may be designated medical checkup institutions for persons with disabilities or re rehabilitation hospitals. Under the object of setting an institutional foundation to support the right to health of persons with disability by establishing a healthcare delivery system for them, institute, institutes may also be designated a central healthcare center or a local healthcare centers for them. As such, even with the numerous issues still needing to be ironed out at this early juncture of the act implementation, there is reason for optimism the right to health of persons with disabilities will improve if state parties can establish and execute such an explicit legal framework to guarantee access to health care for them. Moreover, to enhance the, the understanding of disabilities on the part of healthcare personnel, such as nurses' aides, medical technicians and pharmacists beside health professionals. The same act requires to educate them on the right to health of persons with disabilities with the programs to further the understanding of the def uh, definitions and types of disabilities, communications method, and instructions to follow when providing uh, treatment. However, it is not only healthcare personnel who must gain an understanding of the nature of disability and the right to health of personal persons with disabilities. In Korea, uh, due to the recent proliferation of media reports sensationalizing murderous suspects who have a history of schizophrenia or are suspected of being mentally ill and equating schizophrenic persons with murderers, Despite the fact the vast majority of persons with psychosocial disabilities do not commit crimes, they as a group have become stigmatized as a target of hate by the general public. Such a stigma has led many persons with psychosocial disabilities to avoid hospital uh, treatment, which has in turn resulted in their losing their chance at early diagnosis and treatment. As a result, some people have uh, even advocated increasing forces hospitalization as a solution. It should be understood, however, that such calls for easier enforcement of a forced hospitalization only serve to avoid uh, social responsibility for the problems that have ensued. Hence, an effective preventive solution must include not only the, the establishment of an emergency response system, but also a smooth flow uh, from hospital treatment to the community and the support system within the community. We must focus our attention not merely on how to uh, quarantine persons with psychosocial disabilities, but on how to successfully include them instead. More than anything, the press must stop broadcasting its biased message on psychosocial disabilities. Then who should be the ones to educate healthcare personnel as well as the media and the public about disability and the right to health of persons with disabilities? Since such education conducted from the perspectives of persons without a disability may have a limited effect, we must emphasize the role of disabled persons themselves and of disabled organizations. Indeed, the role of dis disabled persons themselves must us must not stop and simply spreading awareness about disability and the right to health. Through peers of disability who share similar experiences of disability, experience lives in the community, and have ample sensitivity to disability, persons with disability and their families can receive medical and health information and counseling on physical and mental health, which could indeed prove to be effective. 
Such as peer support may start when persons with disabilities and their families first visit the healthcare delivery system for persons with disability and continue throughout their lifetimes. To this end, the healthcare delivery system for persons with disabilities should operate the peer support programs by hiring uh, those with disability to be peer counselors. Moreover, to vitalize such peer support programs, uh, the national and local governments must increase financial support. For example, there is a need to expand wages subsidies for peer counselors and centers for independent living. There is increasing opinion that preventive medicine is more effective than curative medicine, especially for persons with psychosocial disabilities. And as such, those with psychosocial disabilities and families in need of non-medical support, such as peer counseling. Would you like I, to wrap yeah. it up, Professor? Okay. Yeah. I hope today's discussion will help us make a more significant progress toward uh, the achievement of social inclusion and the highest attainable standards of health for persons with disability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for this very exciting presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Anthony Dutin. Mr. Dutin is advisor on disability and rehabilitation at the Pan American Health Organization. In his role, Mr. Dutin is responsible for the disability and rehabilitation strategy in 52 countries and territories. He previously worked for Handicap International as rehabilitation technical advisor in Global Health, which involved the creation of the Handicap International Federation Global Advocacy Strategy for Inclusive Health and Rehabilitation. Mr. Dutin worked in Afghanistan as rehabilitation technical advisor for Handicap International. He has also worked as the regional therapist for the Ministry of Health and Social Services in Namibia, where he oversaw health-related rehabilitation services across four district hospitals and their associated community health program. Mr. Dutina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Sustainable Development Goal 3 seeks to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. This marks an important shift in the way that the World Health Organization and the wider health community is thinking about health. The Millennium Development Goals had three health-related objectives, which specifically focused on child mortality, maternal mortality, and HIV and other infectious diseases. The new agenda has sought to continue progress in these areas, but make a more balanced, holistic, and broader focus on health and well-being. The WHO's strategy for achieving health for all is through universal health coverage, an approach which seeks to ensure that all people receive the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. It's clear that universal health coverage cannot be achieved without including people with disabilities, and yet we know that people with disabilities face greater barriers and inequities in accessing everyday health services as well as specialized health services that are required. The report of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of People with Disabilities last year had a specific focus on the right to health. Whilst I'm sure the Special Rapporteur will be alluding to that, I wanted to highlight a couple of key areas um, that, that we're focusing on. First of all, the direct barriers in health services, such as accessibility, attitudes and discrimination of healthcare providers, and barriers faced in health insurance coverage. I was recently in a country which where a study was conducted amongst people with disabilities suggesting that health facilities were the least accessible public spaces. This is unacceptable and needs to change. The Special Rapporteur's report goes beyond direct health services, however, to also recognize social determinants of health such as poverty to which people with disabilities can be more heavily exposed. Yesterday I had a conversation with Catherine Lyons and her mother trying to change the face of public toilets and sanitary facilities, a basic and fundamental human right for health, personal hygiene and dignity, yet all too often unavailable, inaccessible or inappropriate for people with disabilities. The WHO is committed to ensuring that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is fully implemented across the world. As the leading agency on health, we take particular focus on Articles 25 and 26, whilst at the same time recognizing all articles contribute to good health and well-being for persons with disabilities. 
we're actively working to ensure that people with disabilities benefit from universal health coverage. Our work on disability is undertaken in accordance with the WHO Global Disability Action Plan, which was adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2014. The plan contains three distinct but clear and interconnected objectives. Firstly, remove barriers and improve access to health services and programs. And to achieve this, we're looking at how to tackle discrimination in healthcare settings and developing organization-wide standards of care for the provision of non-discriminatory health care based on best available evidence. Secondly, the plan seeks to strengthen and extend habilitation, rehabilitation, assistive technology, assistance and support services, and community-based rehabilitation. We have developed and are rolling out guidance on strengthening the health system to provide rehabilitation services, and work is underway to develop a package of rehabilitation interventions to facilitate the inclusion of rehab in UHC. Furthermore, following the publication of the first WHO list of priority assistive products in 2016, a global, re a global resolution on assistive technology was, just, was passed just last year at the World Health Assembly. And finally, the plan seeks to strengthen the collection of relevant and internationally comparable data on disability and support research on disability and related services. And the WHO has developed a model disability survey in collaboration with the World Bank and has continued to push for the integration of health data and measurement, incorporating the international classification of functioning disability and health. Unfortunately, services like rehabilitation, assistive technology, and mental health programs remain underfunded and more underprioritized in the health agenda compared to other public health services. In spite of recent signs of greater recognition of these issues, through initiatives like Rehab 2030 and the Global Cooperation on Assistive Te Technology, much, much more needs to be done. There remains an important sensitivity to address when considering health needs in the disability agenda given the legacy of the medical model, and yet the CRPD is clear on a person with disability's right to health. We feel that with the current shift in emphasis within the global health agenda towards an agenda on health for all and greater consideration and emphasis on health equity, it feels we're in an important moment for greater opportunities for designing and implementing inclusive health program that ensures that nobody is left behind. At the WHO, we look forward to working with member states, organizations of persons with disabilities, and other partners in driving forward a health agenda that is fully inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I... I uh, would like to give the floor to our next panelist, Ms. Catalina Devandas Aguilar, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Catalina is a lawyer by training and human rights advocate who has worked extensively on disability issues at national, regional, and international level. Before taking up her duties as first Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, in 2014, she was working as a program officer for strategic partnership with the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund. She was formerly with the United Nations Secretariat Unit of CRPD, as well as with the World Bank as a consultant for disability and inclusive development team for Latin America and the Caribbean region. Ms. Devandas Aguilar has previously served as a board member of the Latin American Network for Persons with Disabilities, representing the region at International Disability Alliance. The floor is yours, Madam Special Representative. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Señora Presidenta, Señores Delegates. And distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished panelists, as you are aware, for a long time, discussions on the rights of persons with disabilities are focused practically exclusively on our health. Looking at the medical model uh, for disability, persons with disabilities were viewed solely as patients to be uh, treated, rehabilitated, and our opinions were uh, habitually ignored by experts in, in, as a majority uh, by health professionals. The consequence, as is well known of this, was segregation, institutionalization, 
and uh, abandonment of several generations of persons with disabilities. It's only from the 60s, which saw the uh, strengthening of the movement for the rights of uh, persons with disabilities, that we've started to move towards a model for human rights. Today, our understanding of disability is that it is a social construct um, derived uh, from interaction uh, with our differences and an adverse environment. It's not possible to address the right to health uh, uh, just uh, in the margin of this important change of paradigm, uh, because in this way we are we are able to focus uh, more effectively on uh, barriers to exercise to the right to health for the persons with disabilities. Uh, having a disability doesn't mean that you're in poor health. Persons with disabilities can uh, lead an active, productive, uh, lengthy and healthy life. However, because of a series of structural factors, persons with disabilities, and this holds good throughout the world, uh, have poorer health than the um, population in general. For example, we're at high risk of falling ill, of um, uh, succumbing to secondary diseases, of uh, having an accident or being victims of violence. Then we have less access to health care uh, and uh, worse uh, social determinants of health than apply to the general population. We're excluded, for example, from education uh, with unemployment and poverty. Uh, boys and girls who are disabled uh, frequently don't receive basic treatment for common childhood diseases and uh, what is even more alarming, a high number of um, newborns with congenital uh, problems such as spina bifida or hydrocephalus die before they are a month old because of a lack of specialised treatment. This is not the inevitable result of being born or living uh, with a disability. It's the result of the failure of states to act. Alas, there is still a series of barriers that have to be overcome to ensure that persons with disability uh, may enjoy the highest possible level of health. As stigmatization, discrimination, a lack of literacy uh, regarding health, uh, barriers uh, to uh, primary and secondary care, uh, not much availability when it comes to uh, specialised services and poor quality thereof, various forms of violence, uh, ill-treatment and abuse in health services. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the CRPD requires states' parties to adopt uh, several measures to improve the right to health of uh, persons with uh, disabilities. The states, as a minimum, have to review their legal and political frameworks. They have to make progress on universal health care, improve accessibility to services, ensure that there is no discrimination and uh, that people with uh, disabilities may uh, participate in life. They have to mobilize resources to implement the necessary measures. It is, in particular, vital that states uh, should uh, include the rights and needs of persons with disabilities in their policies and programs on uh, primary care and specialised uh, health care. Access to uh, primary care is vital to deal with general health needs. Uh, however, it must also meet specific health needs, either directly or by means uh, of... Uh, uh, the provision of specialised services. As I stated uh, clearly in my report, which was, which was mentioned by the representative of the APS, uh, excessive uh, dependency on uh, specialised care uh, can discourage the use of primary care. It can give rise to unnecessary uh, diagnoses or treatment and in increase health cost uh, services. So, the uh, states must boost, bolster and extend programs uh, for empowerment and rehabilitation at all levels, including making available uh, support technologies and devices. In many low- and middle-income countries, uh, only 5% only between 5 or 15 percent of persons with disabilities who need uh, special devices or technologies uh, have uh, access to these. It is unacceptable uh, that uh, this still be deemed a matter of charity. It's also necessary for states to ensure the full observance of the rights of uh, persons with disability when it comes to mm, health uh, services and programs. As I've said uh, more than once, health without human rights is, is not inclusion, it's oppression. 
we want to see a better uh, and uh, greater access to health services, but we also want quality services which do not impair the exercise of our rights. States must provide appropriate high quality services respecting the human rights uh, of um, uh, uh, the disabled, um, looking at um, gender issues and uh, needs throughout life. Ladies and gentlemen, health is vital for sustainable development. A healthy population studies more, is um, more productive, and has better opportunities. If a person with disabilities do not have access to high-quality health care, it's probably they won't be able to go to school, hold a job, or actively participate in the development of their communities. Therefore, looking at the framework of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is vital for states, agencies, and uh, international organizations to ensure international cooperation on health to, to make it inclusive and accessible for persons with disabilities. The, uh, the goals of Objective 3 of the 2030 Agenda cannot be met unless they include a provision for persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh uh, for this wonderful presentation, a uh, very interesting thoughts. Uh, and now I would like to ask the next speaker, Mr. Curry Earle, President of People First of Canada, representing the, the rights and interests of Canadians with intellectual disabilities to make a presentation. Mr. Earle became active with his local People First chapter in 2006. Within three years, he became president of that chapter and active in the provincial chapter People First of Ontario. By 2009, Mr. Earl was appointed as the youth representative to the board of People First of Canada and has been on the national board ever since. He was re-elected as president of People First of Canada for the term 2017 and 20. Mr. Earl, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Your Excellency and uh, Delegates. Peer First of Canada is the national organization representing people with intellectual disabilities. We are the national voice for people who have been labeled with an intellectual disability. We see ourselves as self-advocates and full citizens of our country, living equally in the community. I believe social inclusion it, uh, and health are very much related, uh, related for people with disabilities. I want to start talking about what social inclusion means to me and how it relates, uh, and how it relates to good health for people with intellectual disabilities. To me, social inclusion is having a sense of belonging, being accepted in the community, having a role in the community, taking part in the community life and activities, being involved in activities based on my, uh, being um, involved in my personal choices, having relationships with others based on my choice and common interests, and having friends. When people experience some or all of these things, they're being socially included. When people are socially included, they're more likely to be healthier and happier. Without social inclusion, people are more uh, likely to experience poor physical and mental health, low self-esteem, isolation, and loneliness. And these days, researchers are telling us that being isolated is, and lonely is very unhealthy. That uh, they say that being lonely is about unhealthy as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. But what is being healthy? Having a good health doesn't just mean that you're not sick. Having good health means that you can manage your physical and mental health. It also means that you're able to cope with life many challenges. For people with disabilities, their health and their disability are often mixed up. Many of us still struggle to get away from the medical model of disability and to be treated as more than just the label of the disability. This means the people with intellectual disabilities are more likely to experience poor treatment and health care. We die much younger than people without disabilities. Every year, people with intellectual disabilities 
die in hospitals, avoid, uh, uh, die in hospitals from avoid, avoidable causes. We often do not get the right health care when we need it. One of the reasons for this is because many health care professionals think our health issue is caused by our disability and may not give us the right treatment. Health care professionals are not always trained properly on how to support us or include us in, de us in decisions about our health. Those outside of the world of disability often view us as illness or sickness or being poor health. This view often impacts ability to be included. I know it did it for me. A lot of my personal experience in life has been about, uh, has been about being included. One of, the, one of the biggest reasons that I had to work to be included is because when I was a child, I got the label through the healthcare system as having a disability. The label of my disability meant that I went to a segregated school, a school that had students with disabilities. But for many years, I moved around a lot, 14 and six years. Several times, there were teachers who didn't think I belonged in a segregated school, so they would work to get me moved to a, quote, regular school. Moving from school to, uh, moving school to school had a very negative impact on my, on my being included. It meant that I was never able to do my after-school activities. It meant that outside of my segregated classroom, I had no friends. I felt like that I didn't belong or fit in anywhere. Besides my disability, I had other factors that contributed to me being unhealthy uh, kid when I was growing up. My life was not good. I moved around. I, I moved. I was removed from my family home and put into a foster care system. While I was in foster care, I was well cared for. I had enough food and was in much healthier situation. And things at school began to change. While well, I was getting healthy, I was able to be in a regular school. But this time, it was different. I had the support and a plan I needed to succeed there. And once I was able, uh, once I was stable in school for a while and much healthier, other things began to change. For the first time in my life, I felt like I was really learning. For me, for the first time in my life, I made friends. For the first time in my life, I got invited to a birthday party. That was huge for me. I will never forget that moment. I didn't have the words to uh, words for it back then, but when I was socially, uh, when I was being socially included, and it did a lot for me. Being in that school, being included and accepted by other students helped me find my voice. It gave me self-confidence. I got to be part of the things um, that a regular kids uh, take for granted. I had the chance to join groups and committees. I was learning to, to advocate for myself and to speak up for myself. I had friends and life outside of school. I learned that I had a voice and I wanted people to listen to me. And I had been using my voice to advocate for myself and others. At PFRS Canada, we promote members advocating for themselves and we work to give them the tools and resources that they need to make it easier. We have developed several presentations around health, wellness, and well-being that we use our, within our member, with our membership to promote good health, but we also have developed presentations for frontline health care workers. This led PFRS Canada to develop a national resource called the core tools, the core value, uh, values tools. This tool has a module for healthcare and dental care, and it describes to staff how they can be more accommodating to patients with such disabilities. This resource has been presented to provincial dental associations and has helped them to better understand 
and serve their patients with intellectual disabilities. We continue to update and use this presentation to groups to develop practices that are inclusive and accommodating to people with intellectual disability. This topic, social inclusion and health, is a big one. There are many causes and factors that contribute to both. But some things are very clear to me. Being excluded impacts people's health. Disability and healthcare are not the same thing. Being included in school is a big part of social inclusion. The, the right support and the networks is very important to both health and social inclusion. Self-advocacy is very, uh, it's very important in personal health care and inclusion in any kind. I want to thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Earl, to sharing and being so honest with us. And I think this is exactly that you are here with us. We are so happy and honored and welcome to the UN. And thank you for that again. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, dear delegates, I would like to hand over to my co-chair, Ms. Kate Swoffer, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of the C Civil Society representative from the Dementia Alliance International. Kate, I hand it over to you. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, Ambassador Catalan Bagway, permanent representative of Hungary to the UN. It is my privilege and honor to co-chair with you today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Gates and UN DESA for recommending and inviting me to this panel. As a woman with disabilities myself and professional working for more than a decade for the rights of persons with disabilities, I know the importance of the issues we are discussing in this round table. Now allow me to introduce and invite Ms. Yanni Rosa Damayanti to address this panel. Ms. Damayanti is founder of the Indonesian Mental Health Association and Transforming Communities for Inclusion, Asia, TCI Asia, Indonesia. Ms. Damayanti is a steering committee member for TCI Asia. She is a national leader in Indonesia in the forefront of policy formation and reform towards ensuring all rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities. She is a founder of the Indonesian Mental Health Association and also a lead member of the ASEAN Disability Forum. She brings a decade of experience in advocacy for the human rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia. She has participated in several regional and global advocacy events, CRPD-related forums, and is a dogged self-advocate when it comes to the civil political rights of persons with psychosocial dis disabilities in the Asian region. She has earned the respect of the Indonesian government and is now in regular process of participation in national law and policy making. Ms. Damianti, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Health and well-being are a precondition for a full and productive life for persons with disabilities because they affect a person's person ability to participate fully in all aspects of life work and education and to live independently and be included in the community. Health and social inclusion are intimately related. Therefore, it is saddening to say that for persons with psychosocial disability, health services could mean seclusion from society. In many countries in Asia, health services for persons with psychosocial disability are often provided in close-up institutions like mental hospital and social care institutions excluded from community. Persons with psychosocial disability are placed in these facilities by force without their consent. In Japan, nearly 300,000 persons with psychosocial disability are placed in mental asylum involuntarily. The average length of stay is 300 days, many stays for years. In a report on the condition of people with psychosocial disability released in 2016, Human Rights Watch stated about mental institution in Indonesia. Overall, we found evidence of arbitrary detention, physical and sexual violence, forced seclusion, 
enforce contraception as well as involuntary treatment including electroshock therapy without anesthesia. In one social care institution near Jakarta that I visited, all residents of around 420 people were injected with anti-psychotic injections every two weeks. It is horrifying to see that the medications used, regardless of the diagnosis, are the same with the same dosage. The residents we interviewed did not know what was given to them and never gave their consent. The administration of this medication is monitored by a psychiatrist. Report from Human Rights Watch and finding by Indonesian National Commission on Violence Against Movement, some facilities perform forced contraception and ster sterilization toward female patients and residents. Looking at this situation, one of the biggest issues in the mental health services for persons with psychosocial disability is the denial of the rights of the free and informed consent to agree or to refuse medical treatments and institutionalization. Informed consent is a fundamental principle of medical ethics and international human rights law, and forcing individuals to take medica medicines and other treatments without their knowledge or consent contravene the very basic of human rights. We need to uphold zero coercion policy and ban all forms of involuntary treatment. The practice of institutionalization in mental hospitals and social care institutions violates so many articles in CRPD and other human rights instruments. Serious effort must be made by all parties to stop this practice toward person with disability, particularly person with psychosocial disability. In order to do so, we need to evaluate and revise the Mental Health Act. In many countries in Asia, Mental Health habitually, Mental Health Act often the source of practice that contradict the CRPD. It legalizes forced hospitalization and forced treatment. Mental Health Act also usually mandates the formation of more mental hospitals, which is not according to CRPD. For persons with psychosocial disability who live outside of institution, another another problem occurs. The gatekeeping by mental health system of assessing, conditioning, controlling, and restricting our exercise of our rights. In Indonesia, the health workers play a big role as gatekeepers that keep persons with disab psychosocial disability from being included in society. In this role, Indonesian health workers become a huge barrier in social inclusion for persons with psychosocial disability. Everywhere, when persons with psychosocial disability try to be part of society, they must face psychiatric examination first. To apply for a job in government offices or in some private sectors, every applicant must submit mental health certificate as a proof that applicants are mentally fit. This mental health certificate is obtained after passing a series of psychiatric tests and examination. If the result of examination shows that you have any kind of mental illness, you won't get the certificate. Hence, you're not allowed to apply for the job. The psychiatric examination also widely used to assess job promotion, to screen out candidates for public offices, to examine parliamentary candidates, to check out scholarship applicants. One of its famous functions is to block persons with psychosocial disability from voting in the election. These medical examinations are performed not to help persons with psychosocial disability to be included in society, but to, to screen them out to make sure that they stay away and not becoming a hindrance of society. These examinations are not free, of course. Doctors' fees must be paid, and since it's not covered by insurance, all applicants might, must pay it for themselves. So far, no comments or protests have been heard from either the health ministry or the medical association regarding this discriminatory policy. Medicine alone do not guarantee people with psychosocial disability to live inclusively in society. There are thousands of people living in social care institutions. They, they take or are forced to take medication regularly. But is the administration of the drugs freeing them from living in confinement? confinement? No, they remain in those prisons. They are not allowed to live without permission from the family. They have no right to decide. Even though they manage to get out of that place, where would they go? They have no place to live, no work, no income, no social life. 
they have lived in isolation for years and in Indonesia and many countries in the world, there is no social protection for them. What is worrying is the world trend that narrows the needs of persons with disability as limited to the need of four medications alone. All effort, energy, human resources, financial resources are deployed and focused only on answering this one problem. This is wrong. The same amount of attention and priority must also be given to other aspects to enable a person with psychosocial disability to live independently, to live life fully and included in society. Aspects such as housing, employment, income must be given priority. This raising concern on psychosocial disability should not be used for the pharmaceutical companies to gain profits. In terms of treatment, persons with psychosocial disability should be allowed to choose what kind of treatment they would like to have. Option must be made available and supported, especially treatment outside of psychiatric pharmacology treatment, including counseling and other alternative treatments. If people do choose to take medication, the generic version of the neuro medication with least side effects must be provided. It is of a deepest concern that only limited old school medication with heavy side effects like Parkinson's are accessible in generic forms. The newer generation of drugs with fewer and milder side effects are not available at generic form, even though the drugs patent have been expired. This caused the price to be extremely expensive, could be up to 20 times of the price of the generic version. The national health insurance cannot afford to cover the cost. All in all, health is a very important aspect of life of people with disability. But health do not stand alone. It is interconnecting with other aspects that has been described in the CRPD. It is unbelievable how other disabilities has departed from the medical model of disability towards social and human rights model of disability, while psychosocial disability is still stuck in this medical model only. It's time to change that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Damayati, for your excellent presentation. I would like to thank all panelists, panelists for their presentations, especially Mr. Corey Earle. As a member myself of civil society, I know how exhilarating it can be to be given a forum like this to speak at, but I also know how terrifying it might have been. So well done. <laughs> Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we now move to the second phase of this round table, that is interactive discussion between the panelists and delegations. As we informed you at the outset of the panel discussion, in the following segment of approximately one hour or so, there will be opportunities for delegations and other observers to request the floor to either pose specific questions to panelists or make a brief comment relevant to the current topic in this round table. To make such requests, delegations, please do so by pressing your button. Delegates shall speak from their seats in the floor when their names are recognised. For accredited NGOs and other participants, please submit your request via email to enable at un.org, copying to zhang, Z-H-A-N-G-G, -G, at un.org. When the names of your organisation are called by the chair, please proceed to the designated NGO speaker seat in the back corner and speak from that seat. When you take the floor, please first identify yourself and the title of the organisation you are representing. Please either pose specific questions to any panellists or make your brief comments relevant to the current discussion. Please do not read prepared statements. You may speak no more than three minutes, with no exception. The floor is, now the floor is open. I need a screen.
Apologies for the technical delay. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would recognise Barbados delegation as the first one in my list. I kindly invite you to take the floor. There appears to be no one here from Barbados, so we'll move on to the next delegate. From uh, I recognise um, a delegate from Bangladesh. I kindly invite you to take the floor. Slightly more technical co complications up here. <laughs> Apologies. So I'd recognise uh, Finland delegation as the first one on my list. I kindly invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson, distinguished panellists. The CRPD requires that in the area of sexual and reproductive health, State parties shall provide the same quality and standard of health care to persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. However, the sexual and reproductive health rights and services of persons with disabilities are typically overlooked. Taboo, stigma and stereotypes around disability, sexuality and reproduct re reproductions are still widespread. In addition, restrictive legislations and lack of access to comprehensive sexual education and services create significant barriers for persons with disabilities. Promoting gender equality, sexual and reproductive health and rights are long-standing prior priorities in Finland's development policy and cooperation. We recognize that these rights are strongly linked to social economic rights and that they are key to sustainable development. Unfortunately, in the current political climate, there is an increasing pressure and opposition to sexual and reproductive health rights and attempts to weaken the existing normative frameworks. Strong and systematic commitment and efforts are needed to make these rights a practical reality for all. Therefore, my question to the panel is, what could state parties do to ensure that intersection of gender, disability and age is systematically considered and addressed so that all women and girls are fully included into sexual and reproductive health related legislations, policy and services? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now invite um, the International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus. Thank you. On behalf of the International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus, the global umbrella organization of over 60 Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus associations spread over five continents, we represent many thousands of people living with Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus and their families. Spina bifida is a congenital disability. Children are born with it. Hydrocephalus is a brain condition with a variety of causes, the majority acquired after an untreated neonatal infection. A large proportion of children born with spina bifida might also develop hydrocephalus. With proper treatment and support, children with these disabilities can thrive and live their lives equal to others. While we acknowledge that the births of around one-fourth of children under the age of five are never recorded, Children born with disabilities are not registered in larger proportions than their non-disabled peers. This is a violation of CRPD Article 18, Paragraph 2, which states that children with disabilities shall be registered immediately after birth and have the right to a name, nationality, and being cared for by their parents. Birth registration is a fundamental right recognized by the International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Sustainable Development Goals also call to provide legal identity for all, including birth registration, especially in Target 16.9.
We would like to remind delegates that children with disabilities not registered at birth are at greater risks of ne neglect, institutionalization, and premature death. The need to acknowledge legal existence is paramount for further inclusion in life. We experience this in our work day in, day out. In one of our studies, we found that there are many more children born with spina bifida than, than officially recognized, grossly underestimating the real prevalence of children with congenital disabilities in official statistics. In another study, we found that generosity, consideration, and humaneness towards others in the community, something that cannot be captured in legal lingo, is paramount to survival of children with spina bifida and hydrocephalus, even more than any medical intervention. As this study was performed in Uganda, we used the local term Ubuntu Bulamu, which might translate something like a sense of belonging or acceptance in the community. Ubuntu Bulamu is a task for us all. We, we representative organizations, try to showcase the resilience in our community. This sense of belonging can only be achieved if we all work together to change outdated beliefs, remove superstitions and stigma, and promotes consideration and humaneness towards others in the community. As the Special Rapporteur just stated, children born with a disability more often die because of the lack of care than because of the disability itself. And at the opening of this co of Conference of State Parties, the UN Secretary General talked about inclusion of persons with disabilities. Inclusion is not only about making sure that the building is accessible. It's not only about work. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite the Minister for Disability Services, Mr. Finian McGrath. Please start again, sir. Would you like to give the floor to Ireland, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good, good evening, everybody. I'll start again. Uh, Finney McGrath, Minister of State for, uh, for Disabilities in Ireland. Can I say, first of all, I want to thank and commend Corey and Jenny for their excellent contributions to your forum. But I think the important part here now is for us to come up with practical things we can do to resolve the issues that you've raised. So what I'd like to do is make a few short comments in relation to what actions can government take to assist uh, improve healthcare for people with disabilities. Do we have examples of good practice, which we, uh, a lot of us do, and a lot of countries here do? And the third issue, how can we train healthcare workers to work with people with disabilities? Now, can I say, as a government minister, uh, my job is to ensure, from a practical level, that we need to uh, do a number of things. And the suggestions I would make for a very practical suggestion is that every government and every minister, and in my case, Minister for Disabilities, we have to invest in our disability and health and education services that happen, and that we also have to ensure that the mindset in governments changes towards prioritizing services for people with disabilities. And that comes with a cost, and we have to change that mindset. And if that mindset means you don't have tax cuts in a budget rather than investing in services, we have to take the decisions in the interest of the persons with a disability. The second uh, point I'd like to say is every single government should be involved in this process. Uh, every government department should be involved in this process. Uh, the third thing I'd say is that we need reform in disability services and we have to put the person with the disability at the centre of all our services. In relation to practical measures on the ground, I feel very strongly, and this has got to happen both in our own countries but also internationally, that all nurses, all doctors, dentists, personal assistants, etc., are trained on disability matters uh, while they're training in their profession. Colleges, third level education institutes, third level schools all have to have people with disabilities involved in this education and training. And we have examples of this 
in our own country where people with uh, disabilities go into our third level uh, tr colleges and deal and talk about the disability and expand the training of staff. We also have to, on a health point of view, a very clear thing is we need to have a, a clear health and physical education program for all children with a disability. In other words, a plan from the cradle to the grave. Because the impact of physical education and health and the whole issue of exercise uh, came up yesterday in the sports uh, section of the debate was a very important aspect to the health care of young people with disability. And if you get thousands of children in every country involved at a young age with disabilities in all subjects, sports, and physical education, that is good for their personal health, but it's also more importantly, it's good for their self-esteem and personal development. Uh, finally, definitely from my experience with the board. Uh, Apologies. Thank you, Minister McGrath. Yeah. Thank you very much, Minister McGrath, for that excellent um, presentation. I now invite Ms Julieta Cavatuna, Deputy Minister of Health and Social Services of Namibia. Please take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the social inclusion of the right and the right to the highest attainable standard of health for people with disability was set as a priority by the, by the government of the Republic of Namibia. For instance, with people with disability have access to free medical care. There is a provision of assistive needs for people with disabilities, such as the sunscreen for albinism, orthopedic assistive devices for those who are physically disabled, provision of disability grant, and, available, and availability of social workers for home visit to uh, to support children with disability and people with mental related disabilities, just to name a few. The ministry currently is also facing with an issue of the concern regarding the concern for, for sexual and reproductive health services provision to people with disability in all spheres. Also, the ministry is currently reviewing the mental health bill that we have so that it can be very inclusive and also adjust, address issues of, of major concerns. What I would like to ask to the panelists is to inquire what, could, what the State Party could do in order to ensure that the mental health issues receive the much needed attention and prominence in our discussions as a country. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Julieta Cavatino. I now invite the delegation of United Arab Emirates to take the floor. Thank you. In the United Arab Emirates, health and well-being is a national priority, and the right of persons with disabilities or people of determination, as we say in the UAE, to the highest attainable standard of health is protected by universal health coverage for all citizens. Beyond health, the government has instated, instated policies and programs based on happiness and the promotion of positivity in our communities, which are driven by the Minister of State of Happiness and Wellbeing. Through programs and initiatives under the Ministry of Community Development and Ministry of Health, the government works with families and persons with disabilities to ensure their needs are met, while also guaranteeing full access to information. By providing access to quality, effective, and affordable health care and information, we aim to ensure that persons with disabilities can live their best lives without compromising health status. I would like to share a few examples of best practices in this field. The federal law number 29 of 2006 concerning the rights of people with disabilities protects the rights of people with disabilities and guarantees them the right to live with dignity. 
Article 2 of the law provides a person's special needs shall not be a reason to, develop, to deprive him or her of their rights and services, especially in welfare, as well as social, economic, health, educational, professional, cultural, and leisure services. The Ministry, the Ministry of Health and Prevention and, and the health authorities issues disability assessment reports and accredits medical reports for people with disabilities. The Department of Health provides assessments to the mental status and work fitness levels for people with disabilities. And also, if there is any medical emergencies for any person with disability, they can get special help by sending a special message to a part particular telephone number to get the right support. Through these policies and programs, we work to ensure that we are al aligning with global frameworks and guidance on health within the Convention so that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite uh, a joint statement from civil society between the Centre for the Human Rights of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry and the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. Please take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. The CRPD prohibits forced psychiatric interventions and calls for positive policy instead. And I wish to contribute especially to the requests that have been made by some delegates for action-oriented way of thinking. First, mental health crisis must be removed from the category of medical emergencies and recognized as personal and social in nature. Second, instead of medical interventions like psychotropic drugs or repressive ones like detention, we need two kinds of support. We need decision-making support tailored to crisis situations, not support to decide on treatment, but to d deal with the situation that has become a crisis in the person's life. We also need support to manage practical affairs during a crisis and to maintain safety and well-being according to the person's will and preferences instead of labeling someone as a danger to self and intervening against her will. Third, to replace the label of danger to others, we need fair police and justice systems that are fair towards people experiencing mental health crisi crisis who are victims of crime or accused offenders. And we need access to conflict resolution for interpersonal disagreements. These functions must be delinked from support to differentiate their duty towards multiple parties from the supporter's duty of loyalty to a single individual. This policy complements state's immediate duty to abolish substitute decision making and arbitrary detention, which as Ms. Damayanti very eloquently demonstrated, is what people with psychosocial disabilities currently meet in the mental health system. Non-coercive mental health services are one way to receive support, but they do not define our crises or play a supervisory role. I welcome panelists' views on this approach, which situates mental health crisis fully within the social model of disability of CRPD. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now ask the next uh, civil society organization, um, the Red de Asistencia Legale Social, to please take the floor. Me llamo Gabriel. Agradezco el espacio que me ha brindado forma parte de una asociación civil. I should like to thank you. We are a part of a civil society organization in Argentina call uh, RAL. We are working on barriers to access to health care in our country. Um, we have uh, uh, barriers to um, education, uh, secondary education and um, uh, university education, and we are uh, working to uh, provide such access uh, as uh, for um, uh, non-disabled citizens. Uh, at present, a, a disabled person uh, should have uh, education coverage, uh, care, 
and um, assistive aids. Uh, however, there are still barriers that uh, m make it difficult to arrive at in uh, social inclusion when it comes to health care. We uh, are in endeavouring to ensure that uh, uh, doctors become aware of the fact that uh, we uh, need uh, medical care, but uh, very often we do find that uh, uh, persons uh, of lower income uh, find it difficult to obtain medical care, to travel, and all airlines should take into account the needs of persons with disabilities and not impose uh, conditions, uh, for example, um, requiring higher prices for uh, facilities. A person with disability should be independent when it comes to being able to take decisions and health. The convention has uh, to be implemented. It requires uh, monitoring of public policies when it comes to the participation of our organizations. Uh, and uh, we need uh, uh, oversight when it comes uh, to uh, health uh, care and the deficiencies. Only in this way can we ensure that nobody is left behind. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your intervention. I uh, recognise um, the next civil society member, Association of Disabled People of Uzbek. Uzbekistan, please take the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mirja Khantrudi from Uzbekistan. Here I'm representing the Association of Disabled People of Uzbekistan. The association is the national umbrella organization of uh, several individual DPOs and NGOs of Uzbekistan. While I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak at the Conference of State Parties to deliver the first ever speech from my country, I have mixed feelings about it. Because the voices of the persons with disabilities must be expressed and presented by the persons with disabilities themselves, not by the able-bodied representative. Unfortunately, mainly due to financial resources, the persons with disabilities of Uzbekistan remained unheard and invisible again at this event. And it's once more proves that nothing about us without us and nobody left behind mottos are yet to be practiced, not only referred for political correctness. Due to political division of the world into continents and historical context of Uzbekistan as post-Soviet country, our DPOs are in the gray area of affiliation either with Asian disability movement due to their geographic location or European groups because of Russian language communication of DPO leaders. But neither of them, neither of these two regions have advanced in extending their platforms for Uzbekistan's DPOs. I subscribe to the words of Ruth Warwick from Ida when she said yesterday that we call on member states and the UN system to invest in the capacity of DPOs. We recommend an urgent, significant, and coordinated investment in capacities of DPOs, particularly underrepresented groups, to be able to meaningfully engage in decision-making processes. This call is relevant to Uzbekistan's and Central Asian DPOs as well to ensure the laws and policies and their implementations include the voices and interests of the persons with disabilities. For your information, this is a region of over 70 million population. Often developing countries integrate the advanced knowledge and practices of inclusive development through the development aid programs of international organizations. Therefore, I urge international development organizations and donor community to fully shift from the status quo and tokenistic approach towards practically inclusive approach in designing, planning, implementing, evaluating the aid programs and projects. Their roles should not only be limited to financial or technical assistance, but the employees and national partners should demonstrate inclusive approach through their behaviors, attitudes, principles, and timely communications. For instance, the DPOs and NGOs working with disabilities in Uzbekistan and concerned that UNICEF started situation analysis in 2016 has not been results yet, even so three, past year, three years past. Due to ongoing political and uh, social transformation, Uzbekistan government is open for collaboration. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. I now ask the Honourable Minister Sakai Nizenza, Minister of Public Service, Labour and Social Welfare from Zimbabwe to take the floor, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Mine is a brief comment relevant to what has been presented. Speaking from the Zimbabwean experience, I want to focus just quickly on issues affecting the people living with disabilities, particularly those in the rural areas. The challenges relate mainly to stigma and discrimination and the lack of understanding of what it, need, what it means to be disabled. This is also compounded by issues of poverty and unemployment. More recently, Madam Speaker, Zimbabwe was affected by a major devastating cyclone called Cyclone Idai. As a result, a number of disabled people were affected. As a result, this worsened their situation. What has Zimbabwe done in order to address issues affecting people living with disabilities? Madam Speaker, we have a disability policy that has resulted in major consultations right across the country. We've also focused on building houses for a number of people who are disabled, particularly in the rural areas. This is a new intervention that had not been done before. We're also focusing in promoting the voices of the people living with disability and taking very seriously the message that nothing about us without us. The delegation, Madam Speaker, that is here with me from Zimbabwe is a testimony in taking that message very seriously. Finally, Madam Speaker, I would like to emphasize the fact that Zimbabwe takes seriously the mantra that we must fight stigma as well as mobilize resources while we promote primary and specialized care as well as promote inclusion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for your intervention. I now ask Mr. David Ole Sanko, Member of Parliament from Kenya, to kindly take the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, my question uh, is that in Kenya, majority of prisoners in Kenya have psychosocial disability, hence require medical attention more than imprisonment or confinement. What are the best practices in solving such issues? My second question is that in Kenya, we are advocating for the inclusion of provision of assistive devices such as wheelchairs, calipers, uh, crutches, and even sunscreen lotions uh, in insurance covers, including our national insurance uh, fund, uh, which have been just been launched as a universal insurance fund in our country. The panelists here are advocating uh, that we move away from viewing disability as a health problem. Please, I need an advice on how or what is the alternative approach in such situation, because for us here, it seems there is a contradiction. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much for your two questions. Uh, I may be um, corrected, but it might be um, sensible to give the first question to uh, Ms. Damianti, who spoke about psychosocial um, disabilities in Indonesia. Would you like to respond to that question? About the psychosocial disabilities and how to um, better support them in... Uh, yeah. Um, about the condition of person with psychosocial disability in prisons, this is actually a very crucial problem that never been addressed seriously up to now uh, in uh, many parts of the world. I think this is uh, this is uh, should be one of the uh, concern of us: how to uh, help person with psychosocial disability in prison. Um, as for 
person with sexual disability in general what needs to be uh, 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 to be the focus is that like what I said in my presentation that the life of person with psychosocial disability is not is not limited only in the medical sphere like many people seen today when we see the global mental health movement in the world it's all see a uh, viewing person with psychosocial disability of only need medication this is wrong person with psychosocial disability needs all aspects of life just like any other people in the uh, 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 in the world they need housing they need uh, a job they need uh, to build up families they need social interaction they need uh, a political life they need uh, a cultural life and etc etc so it's not limited only that um, so what is important is that to to understand that medication and uh, health is only one part of the life of person with sexual disability and others uh, other aspect of of their life must be addressed as a priority as well without that there is no um, there is no uh, inclusion of person with sexual disability uh, in public life so this is uh, my comment thank you for your comment I'm wondering if any other panel panelists um, feel they want to respond to those questions as well We'll move on to the statements. Um, next, I would ask the delegation of the European Union to kindly take the floor. Madam President, the European Disability Strategy 2010-2020 aims at the provision of equal access to health care. The protection of health and safety of workers is a key element of EU labour law. Efforts have also been undertaken to improve accessibility of health care for patients, including those with disabilities. An action plan has been developed to anticipate future skill needs for health professionals. It fosters community-based care and pays attention to the increasing number of older persons with chronic diseases that experience disabilities associated with age. The EU has invested through Horizon 2020 program um, million funding for research that concerns disability and health. However, the availability of knowledge and provision of healthcare services to address rare diseases and the related disabilities remain a particular challenge. Furthermore, gaps continue to exist between the unmet medical needs of persons with and without disabilities. Because of the reduced number of patients of these diseases and limited available resources, it is necessary to step up cooperation and exchange of information and expertise. Madam President, considering the multiple and diverse challenges in this area, what would the panel uh, suggest for policy priorities to invest in in order to improve the standards of health for persons with disabilities? How to make those priorities? Thank you. Thank you for your intervention and question. If you don't mind, we'll keep questions to the end now to make sure that we do get through our speakers. I would recognise um, the next speaker on my list, the International Coalition for Women's Health, Maria Ni Lathata. Good job. Kindly <laughs> take the floor. Um, Chair, we will look briefly at the sexual and reproductive health rights of people with disabilities in the context of this roundtable. Respect for sexual and reproductive health rights um, is enshrined in many international human rights instruments. But one of the strongest obligations comes from our own treaty. It is placed squarely in the context of the right to health under Article 25 and supported by the guarantee under Article 23 that we can decide freely and responsibly the number and spacing of our children. As stated multiple times today, the UNCRPD mandates that healthcare professionals provide care of the same quality to people with disabilities. This is simply a fiction when it comes to the sexual and reproductive health care for pe with people with disabilities. Women with disabilities, trans men and non-binary people with disabilities are particularly impacted by failures in the medical community to meet requisite standards of care. 
The health inequalities faced here are multifaceted and complex. Disabled people face assumptions about their sexual health needs, a lack of knowledge on disability um, from medical professionals and barriers in built environment, and that's both clinics and in medical device design. Um, in Ireland and the UK, 68% of maternal deaths are women with disabilities. Women with disabilities are less likely to be able to access screening for sexually transmitted infections or cervical cancer screening. It is often assumed that it is unnecessary. Disabled people find themselves unable to access assisted reproduction and fertility treatments on an equal basis with others. Pregnant people with disabilities face high levels of obstetric violence. These inequalities in healthcare outcomes are unacceptable. We also need to be mindful that disabled persons' right to free and form consent and respect for one's decisions, as guaranteed in multiple texts and in Article 12, is frequently infringed when one seeks reproductive and sexual health care. Forced sterilisation through traditional surgical methods and non-consensual use of long-acting reversible contraceptives is still widespread. Forced abortion is all too common and forced pregnancy, exists, forced pregnancy and birth exists everywhere abortion rights are restricted. Um, we need to respect will and preferences in all areas of reproductive health care. It's important to remember the wider social implications uh, of this form of health care. Um, when we talk social inclusion in particular, we cannot ignore the sexual and reproductive health rights in this context. Through Article 25 and through Article 23, we are guaranteed the right to have children, the right to not have children, and the support needed to give effect to these decisions, but it is all premised on the right to the best health available to us. Um, these decisions uh, determine so much of a person's lived experience in life. This is not a side issue. If states are bringing their national legislation and policies in line with the Convention, they need to reconsider all of their laws with disability equality and gender equality in mind. They need to apply the framework of the Convention to this area to make sure that no one... Thank you for your intervention. I now recognise Mr Matthias Like, Deputy Director, Federal Bureau for the Equality of People with Disabilities from Switzerland, to kindly take the floor. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, this is just a small comment, and I want to second the Minister from um, Ireland. Um, NCDs are... Um, uh, are now a bigger health crisis than ever, and many countries in the world are taking this on, this challenge on, and are investing in health promotion and are investing in uh, in prevention programs as well. Um, and NCDs impact disproportionately also um, the life of uh, people with disabilities, and. Um, I, I just want to um, make sure that we don't forget uh, that also health promotion programs should be accessible for people with disabilities. Um, we from the Federal Bureau um, of Disability Equality in Switzerland, we are supporting a civil so society organization piloting um, uh, to mainstream uh, accessibility in all health promotion programs. And we are committed also to take this up further and um, with our Ministry of Health and with uh, the relevant um, institutions that fund health promotion programs. It is a difficult task since we are a federal state and uh, um, the responsibilities lie with um, other um, institutions or other level of, of uh, state, but we are very committed to do that. And um, I think it would be important that um, also other countries don't miss that opportunity and invest in accessibility of um, health promotion programs. Thank you very much. Thank you for your intervention. I now recognise Dr. Christopher Ballina, Director General for Human Rights, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Mexico, to kindly take the floor. Mexico agradece. Mexico uh, is grateful for the valuable inputs of the panellists, and we believe that the discussions on social inclusion and the right to enjoy the highest possible level of health pursuant to, to uh, Article 25 of the CR Part, Part PDM is timely. Uh, the Mexican law governs uh, health protection for everybody, it lays down the basis and procedures for access to the health services. Uh, Article 1 defines the concept of health as a, a state of 
physical, mental and social uh, well-being, not just the absence of medical conditions or in, um, in diseases. Uh, we uh, wish to ensure that uh, it is possible for those with disabilities to enjoy the highest possible level of health uh, rehabilitation and empowerment without any discrimination on the basis of disability by means of progress, uh, programs and services uh, which consider criteria of quality, specialization, gender, uh, which are uh, free or accessible. We uh, have um, a uh, health uh, service which uh, emphasizes the characteristics to facilitate uh, access, transit, uh, use uh, uh, of um, persons with disabilities for uh, both hospitals and outpatient uh, services. Here, the entire sector of uh, government health care has started uh, to make um, uh, changes to its existing health facilities to enjoy to ensure the uh, accessibility of persons with disabilities. All of this to lay down basic minimum standards of care throughout the country. Mexico, therefore, acknowledges the need for there to be both national and international uh, mechanisms, ways of coordinating things so that we have a 360-degree uh, uh, vision of the provision of health services uh, of a very high quality, uh, laying particular emphasis on the rights of those with disabilities, particularly in institutions working in the public health uh, and social services uh, realms. Here, I would like very much to learn of the opinion of the panelists, ladies and gentlemen, on the basic elements that such uh, coordination mechanisms uh, should rely on in order to promote a, a vision which uh, is focused on the human rights of uh, persons with disabilities, taking into account gender, age, and uh, essentially focus on human rights. I would ask you, how is it possible uh, to uh, have a platform that can uh, provide a, an example for basic minimum standards uh, or, uh, upon which institutions can then uh, build to tackle the challenges in this domain? Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention and the questions. Uh, I now recognise uh, the delegate from the Czech Republic to kindly take the floor. Thank you, yes, yes. Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, just uh, mention that in the Czech Republic there is an act on health care which guarantees for all persons, for inhabitants, uh, equal access to to have care, and uh, also uh, there is a special act on specific health, health care, which uh, regulates some special uh, occasions or some special medical uh, services, uh, which are provided, for example, for two persons with uh, limited uh, capac legal capacity. Uh, which uh, guarantees that uh, the right of those persons are really uh, uh, keep, uh, kept. So uh, a few years, two years ago in the Czech Republic, there was uh, conducted a survey, special survey, uh, about access uh, of persons with disability to health care, and this survey confirmed that uh, access to healthcare as such uh, is, is guaranteed, but there are still some challenges, especially in the field of communication uh, of uh, medical experts and medical staff with persons with disabilities. So in, uh, that's why in our national plan and also in next national plan, uh, for promotion of equal opportunities of persons with disabilities will contain the special measures, uh, special programs, uh, which will train uh, the medical staff uh, in, uh, in the field of communication with persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you kindly. I now recognize uh, civil society, and I'll never get this pronounced correctly, Odem Dos, I've Advedagos de Brazil Cancelo Federal to kindly take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Distinguished delegates, it is an honor for me to deliver this statement as the president of the National Commission on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of the Brazilian Bar Association, which is a civil organization with ECOSOCO status. Alongside my dear colleagues and also lawyers, Sarah Campos and Emerson Damasceno. For centuries, the reality of persons with disabilities has been defined solely on the basis of a person's impairments, resulting in practices that ended up leading to segregation and marginalization. Only with the new approach provided by the CRPD, barriers cannot be considered anymore as caused by disability itself, but rather from the incapacity of social structures to predict and incorporate the diversity of bodies. It is necessary then that any health policy be designed to progressively reach the entire population, preventing discriminatory and injustice practice that end up promoting no access or unequal access to health. Uh, not of less concern, some measures taken by the current Brazilian government violate democratic ideals and social justice by the international, uh, promoted by the international human rights practices. My colleague Emerson Damasceno now will take the floor. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about... Madam, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about the implementation of CRPD, in Brazil also requires pointing out our country is undergoing through turbulent democratic times which directly impact disabled people as well as the other minorities. Let's remember that in the last year, during the current government actions, the country experienced an, an exclusionary policy of human rights as the core plot of its public policies, unlike the previous years. Not to, not to mention that the minorities have steadily suffered at the onset of political instability, but especially throughout year in progress, a process of nest exclusion, exclusion which consequently threatens from LGBT women, African Americans, indigenous, environmentalist communities to persons with disabilities. We must bear in mind the Mariello Franco case, a murder of a young female and black activist who was killed along with his driver, Anderson Gomez. The case has never been solved or duly clarifi or, or cl clarified, and neither the people who planned was convicted for those crimes. Having said that, it's in order to speak about human rights here within these walls which have already housed famous names like Nelson Mandela, Kofi Annan, and Malala Yousafzai. And I sincerely hope that Brazil, as one of the leaders in Latin America, will recover full democracy, so it can be able to give the well-deserved effectiveness of the convention. It's important for Latin America and for the world. It's fundamental for us Brazilians. Uh, thank you. Thank you kindly. I'll now pass the floor back to the co-chair, my other co-chair. Thank you very much. I think we could stay here and listen to each other for a long time. It has been an amazingly inspiring and rich um, discussion. And of course, we don't have too much time because you have to understand that the translators are here for about five more minutes. So now what I would like to ask all the, uh, the panelists just to give them a wrap up moment. What really was so important for you? How you see what happened here in the afternoon? What will you take back with you? And especially we had some questions uh, if you would like to concentrate on that. Professor, may I start with you? Thank you. There are serious challenges we are facing in terms of the health of persons with disabilities. Some of them are relatively easy to solve and the others not. Here I'd like to highlight four things uh, as briefly as possible. Uh, the first thing we should do is to raise public awareness of disability and of the health of persons with disability at a profound level. Uh, raising awareness should not stop and providing the public with the opportunities to experience temporary disabilities. Instead, we should raise a question, the pro perspective from which uh, 
from which persons without disabilities look at those with disabilities. The second thing is that state parties should allocate sufficient funds for the health of persons with disabilities in general, that of persons with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities, persons with multiple disabilities, uh, and senior citizens with disabilities in particular. But how will uh, the money matter? But the money should go to the community uh, persons with disabilities live instead of institutions. Uh, when it comes to issues of uh, women's disabilities, as you know, we need protection from violence and ex exploitations, appropriate social security system to elevate their poverty, and guarantee our reproductive rights and disabled women friendly healthcare services throughout the establishment of laws. One of the most important things is to break down cultural prejudice against women with disabilities and empower them. The third thing we should remember okay, uh, is that we should not rely on the medical model of disability even though we are dealing with the health issues of person with disability. We should focus on social and medical environments that make it difficult for persons with disabilities to access quality Healthcare. The last thing is that you should return to the spirit and principles of CRPD and focus on what people, what people with disability can do, not on what they cannot. Problems related to the limit that persons with dis disabilities have are not the primary considerations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to Anthony Dutin. Thank you. I'll, I'll be very rapid. Um, uh, wonderful questions, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to particularly uh, offer to speak to the delegation from Finland about sexual reproductive health, which I thought was a, a really important uh, point. In one word, my answer is elevating disability on the on the um, discourse around health equity, alongside gender, alongside ethnicity, alongside age. I think this is a key aspect in the in the health agenda. The second thing that's really struck me is the importance of data. The health system drives its decision making based on data and evidence, and all too often evidence around disability is missing within a disaggregation in health, and I think we need to uh, be better at looking at um, data that shows the need for the health sector to take action on practices, on inclusion, on accessibility. Um, uh, I'll hand over to colleagues for other things, but I'll be around afterwards to talk. Thank you very much. Um, there were some two uh, similar uh, questions. One, how to create the policy priorities and how to create basic minimum standards. I would like to turn now to Jenny Rosa Damayanti first. Um, yeah, um, I have several recommendations to make. Um, regarding uh, the issue of uh, health and social inclusion. First of all, it is very important recogni to recognize the legal capacity of all persons with disabilities on, e on an equal basis with others and the right to exercise this. As uh, we can hear again and again and again, one of the basic problem for person with psychosocial disability especially is the, their lack of legal capacity therefore they do not have any rights for the free and informed consent and they do not have the right to uh, to refuse or to accept any medical treatment including hospitalization and institutionalization this is very important to address because um, this is one of the biggest problem amongst the um, uh, disability community at, at the time uh, moreover, we have to come to conclusion that mental institutions uh, in all forms, including mental hospitals and social care institutions, which is still very, which is still everywhere, including in Japan, in Korea, in Indonesia, in uh, other places, must be closed down. All medical treatments for persons with psychosocial disability and other people with disability must be conducted outside of the institutional close, close, uh, close up, lock up institutional settings. So all institutions must be closed down and must be our commitment to do so. Um, Thank you very much. We yeah. have all together three minutes. So I would like to ask um, Mr. Earl, what do you take with you from this afternoon? 
Perfect, thanks. Uh, one, one of the biggest things that we got to stop doing is we got to stop labeling people um, because that is the biggest challenge going into the healthcare system. Um, we, must, um, we must have a system that is based on people with disabilities at the table and being part of those decision making. And we must ensure that, um, that we take bold actions. Bold actions, one, that includes people with disabilities. And second thing is, is that when people are at the table, they support that person. They're not going to make a decision that is going to make them go backwards at the end of the day. Far too long and around this world, we've seen that. And lastly is, while Canada has closed um, some of its institutions, we still struggle as a country of uh, three more, three institutions. But the difference is, around the world, I imagine as well, we're opening just smaller institutions. So we gotta stop that model and we gotta come to a conclusion around the world that we must invest and we must come out of here saying that institutions no longer in 2019 deserve to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to ask my co-chair because she herself is uh, uh, representing the civil society here, just to have your final thoughts. Thank you, Ambassador Bogier. It's an honour to have co-chaired this round table with you. Um, leaving no one behind in the 2030 agenda is fundamental to all persons' rights. And as Ms Devandus Aquila said, it is time now for states to act. This includes for all types of disabilities, including those less visible. I'm also proud to represent civil society and thank this round table for ensuring inclusion of people living with disabilities. The reality is that people with disabilities are often still denied access, inclusion and health care. And it does mean we need to move away from a medical view and of labelling of dis by disability only by healthcare professionals to ensure that social services and disability support are provided. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, dear delegates, um, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a very strong afternoon for all of us. I think the beauty of this very period here in the United Nations that really the representatives of the governments the NGOs, the civil society meet each other, listen to each other, and I hope inspire each other. We all have something to take home from this afternoon, and I think there is a lot to take home. We, representatives of the governments, we listen to the civil society and the NGOs, and I hope that we can move on and we can really do everything that this very important topic, what we discussed here this afternoon, will be handled on the highest level. I want to tell you that actually in the United Nations, at the moment, we are discussing the universal health coverage. And I really think that everything what I heard here will or have to be channeled into that as well. So on behalf of my co-chair, on behalf of the Secretariat, Thank you for the interpreters. You are the stars always of all these meetings. I would like to thank the panelists, their fairness, their honesty, their, their, their openness, their willingness to share their knowledge. And I would like to thank the delegates to be here at, after six o'clock. And I hope that you will continue the, your deliberations tomorrow as well during the conference on behalf of Hungary. And my delegation, it was an order to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.